Number 13, for each case below, determine whether the motion is overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped. All right, so you, if you have a mass dash pass spring system with mass half a kilograms and C, uh, three newtons uh, seconds per, per meters, and K is uh, four newtons per meters, uh, if you have these, then it will determine whether the system is overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped. Uh, these here actually do, don't play any role in whether it's uh, damped or not, uh, underdamped or overdamped. Uh, see, because this is just the position, initial position, and the initial velocity. Uh, whether how damped the system is ha has to do with the, these other other variables. Okay, how do you know whether a system is underdamped, overdamped, or critically damped? Well, uh, you have to compute the c squared minus 4mk, which actually is the dis discriminant of the quadratic equation uh, obtained by the characteristic equation of this. All right, um, so th this appears in the quadratic formula as the radicand inside the square root. And... Uh, if this is less than zero, then the system is underdamped. If it's equal to zero, it's critically damped. And if it's over zero, that means it's overdamped. All right. So to quickly figure out which ones are overdamped or underdamped, you have to we have to compute c squared minus four mk. I have the computation here. Uh, just simply, just for example, number one, what you have to do is uh, three squared, which is nine, minus four times one half times four, which is eight. 9 minus 8 is 1, so that's how you get 1. Okay. Now, since it, for these two cases it's above 0, so it must be overdamped. Uh, for the for item 3 is 0, so it's critically damped. Item, item 4, 5, 6, they all have negative values, so they are underdamped. Solve number six of the previous question and also find the pseudo period and the phase angle of the solution. All right, so let's look at item number six. This is uh, 1, 10, 125. And the master equation for mechanical vibration is this. On this right side, if you have external force, you have to put uh, replace uh, this zero by the external force. There is no external force, so we just put 1, 10, 125, write down the characteristic equation, solve it. You can use completing the square, or you can also use uh, the quadratic formula. Either way, you're going to get this, which gives you this uh, solution, general solution. Now, you plug in the initial conditions and uh, compute uh, your C1 and C2 that way. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, and you get this as your answer after plugging those numbers back in. Now what's important is what to do afterwards. See, uh, <clears throat> you have to know how to combine these two uh, sinusoidal functions into a single cosine function uh, in, in the following form. It has to be like uh, C times cosine of uh, omega t minus alpha, where the c is given by square root of negative 6 squared and 2 squared, so that's what we computed. Alpha is supposed to be tangent inverse of b over a, 2 over negative 6, just like this, and you have to add this some, some modifier here depending on which quadrant this uh, a comma b is in, so because a is negative, and b is positive, so it's like, a, so here's the b axis, here's the a axis. So if a is negative and b is positive, you're in the second quadrant. And the thing that you add is a 0 for here, add pi there, and uh, 0 for here, and subtract pi. Well, that's just one convention. Another widely used convention is uh, when you have... Uh, you could also do 0 pi the same, but here you can use pi and 2 pi. That's another convention for choosing this data here. This data can be chosen like this. 
The difference is that if you use this, your resulting alpha will be between negative pi to pi. If you use this, then your resulting alpha will be between 0 to 2 pi. Uh, a lot of times in the engineering, uh, you want to know how the uh, uh, current leads the voltage or, or uh, it follows uh, the voltage. In that case, uh, th this is a uh, more uh, widely used choice in engineering. But either way will be considered correct. So in this here, since it's in the second quadrant, we add pi and and uh, putting this into the calculator, we get the value 2.819. Okay. And then plugging this alpha in here and also C in here, it gives you this final answer. And from this final answer, we can know that the phase angle here, this is called the phase angle, is 2.819. It's radians to be exact. Um, and then pseudo period, we call this pseudo period because uh, this amplitude decaying, this decaying amplitude makes it non periodic. A periodic function never decays, right? But because of this, it's decaying. And therefore, this is called the pseudo, pseudo angular frequency. And to get the pseudo period, you divide 2 pi by the pseudo angular frequency and get 1 fifth of pi. So those are the answers. Number 15, for item number 4 of 13, what is the angular frequency of the external force that will cause practical resonance? Also find this frequency. So let's go back to 13. And item number 4, it has m equals to 2, c equals to 12, k equals to 50. So what do we do? Well, you, we use this formula uh, for finding resonance. This is the amplitude of the steady periodic solution uh, when you have this external force F0 so so if your external force is F0 some some uh, amplitude of the force times cosine of uh, omega t like this then if this is your external force then you can calculate the the amplitude of the steady periodic solution. It comes out to be this one. What is the practical resonance? Practical resonance is basically the the angle of frequency omega, which will make this the largest. All right. Uh, so for for four, if we use those values, uh, this uh, two, twelve, fifty we get this okay and we want to find out the omega that will make this entire thing the largest how do you do that well you since this is in the denominator the entire thing will be maximized if you make the denominator uh, as small as possible so you want to minimize the denominator to minimize the denominator you want to uh, differentiate it and say equal to zero because you need the critical points uh, this will be minimize the critical numbers so you differentiate and when you differentiate you get this and you see that uh, omega could be zero or omega squared minus seven could be zero but omega equal to zero means that you don't have any angular frequency that's not what we we're looking for so we should throw that out actually if you know the graph of this at omega equal to zero you will have a, a relative maximum at that point so the, it, there's another re purely mathematical reason why you don't want to choose omega equal to zero but uh, just out of physics, we can just uh, uh, exclude omega equal to zero and just focus on when omega squared is equal to seven. And uh, if we solve for omega, since uh, the angular frequency should be positive, uh, we we choose omega as two point six four five eight. And then to get the frequency of the um, practical resonance. The frequency is uh, omega over 2 pi. That's how you get the frequency from the angular frequency. And if you do that, you get uh, 0 0.4211 as the uh, frequency of the external force that will cause the, the practical resonance. Number 16, find the steady periodic solution if an external force of Ft, 10 cosine 3t newtons, is applied to the spring dash pot mass system with spring constant 5, this is k equals to 5, damping constant 
4, that's c equal to 4, and mass of 1 kilogram, that's m equals to 1. So in the master equation, mx double prime plus cx prime plus kx equals the external force, we put 1, 4, 5, and that's equal to external force 10 cosine 3t. This is what we have to solve. To solve this, we first have to find the complementary solution, uh, and then uh, the solution becomes this, either by completing the square or uh, quadratic formula, and we can write down the complementary solution like this. This complementary solution is called the transient solution because, as you can see, this exponential decay makes this very small, very close to zero when t is relatively large. And therefore, the only thing that survives, uh, I mean, most of the, the x value will be coming from xp. Remember, x is xc plus xp, right? xp plus xc gives you the general solution. But this part is almost 0, and you would mostly be getting the xp. That's why this is called the transient solution. It only appears briefly. Um, now, we look at the right side and decide that uh, the yp should have a cosine 3t and b sine 3t. Make sure that there's no duplication with the complementary solution. There is none, so we can just continue doing this calculation. Uh, we need, In order to plug this into the left side, we need to have the derivative and, and its second derivative, so we differentiate. One important tip is to write down the derivative of this on here, this way, because uh, then you have sine on one side and cosine on one side. Uh, that makes it easier to compute, okay? So uh, cosine difference is negative sine, sine difference is to positive cosine. Every time you differentiate this, uh, 3 appears in the front. And then uh, sine difference is to cosine, cosine difference is to negative sine. So we got the first and second derivative. Now how do, what do you do with this? Well. Uh, we, we have to compute x double prime plus 4x prime plus 5x prime, 5x, right? So what you want to do is you want to take uh, x prime p and multiply by 4 because that's what you want, which gives you uh, 12, right? 3 times 4 is 12. And there's another 12 here. And then uh, for this one, you multiply by 5 because that's what we need. So that's uh, 5a, 5b. And then you add them up. So 5a minus 9a, that's negative 4a, plus 12b. That's all with, with uh, cosine 3t attached, so we can factor that out. And then for this one, sine 3t is attached, so we, if we factor that out, 5b plus negative 9b gives you negative 4b, and you have negative 12a here. Since I want this to equal to the right side, which is 10 cosine 3t, we need this uh, negative 4a plus 12b to equal to 10, whereas negative 12a minus 4b should equal to 0. The second equation gives us uh, b equals to negative 3a. If you move the 4b to the other side and divide by 4, you get b equals to negative 3a. Plug that back into the, the top one, and you get uh, negative 4a minus 3, 36a equals to 10. Uh, by the way, uh, actually the faster way is to just multiply this by 3. So that uh, 3 times negative 4 gives you negative 12. Negative 12 plus 12 is 0. So if you just simply add the top and bottom, you get uh, this negative 40a equals to 10 really quickly. Okay, so try using that method rather than substitution. Okay, and then uh, you divide by negative 40 to get uh, uh, your a as negative 3 over 4. Plug that back into this relation. b is negative 3a, so you get b as 9 over 4. Plugging a and b back into the particular solution form, you get this as the solution, which is called a steady periodic solution. Now, when you have a steady periodic solution written this way, you really don't know what the amplitude of this sinusoidal function is, nor what is the phase angle, whether uh, this is uh, trailing or uh, leading the external force. So, it's uh, you, you have to know how to put this into a single cosine function. How do you do that? Oh, actually, a, uh, a is negative and b is positive. Sorry, there's a uh, a. So let's just scratch this. Okay, since a, b is in the second quadrant, in the second quadrant, what do you have to do? We have to add pi, right? 
Sorry about that. Let me fix this. Okay. Uh, See, so A is negative, B is positive, so you're in the second quadrant. So you have to add pi. And then uh, C is square root of A squared plus B squared. If you compute that, it's 2.3717. And alpha is this over that. Since uh, they both are over 4, you really have to do 9 over negative 3. 9 divided by negative 3 is negative 3. So put this into the calculator, plus pi, and you get 1.8925. And put into this form, um, the, the, the form uh, C times cosine omega t minus alpha, right? Where, where alpha is same as before. And, uh, no, where omega is same as before, alpha is this thing that you found, and then C, you found it here. So if you write in this form, uh, that's how you should write down the steady periodic solution. That's, uh, this way, it's much more useful. It gives you more useful information, just uh, much more than just having this as your answer.